I think there's a quality that uh, all of these people that we're talking about have is joy. Yes. Bardem has joy. Belmondo has joy. Newman has joy. We're watching people who are filled with joy doing what they love to do. And that joy just comes right off the screen. And whether it's conscious or unconscious, I think we are unconsciously very nurtured by joyful performers. Welcome to another episode of the Philosopher's Movie Talk Show. I'm Chris Bush. I'm Dean Slider. On the Philosophers, we talk about film and philosophy with people who make and who love the movies. And we are delighted to have as our guest today, the wonderful screen and stage actor, Michael Nouri, known for films such as Flashdance and The Hidden and TV roles in shows like Damages, O.C., NCIS, and most recently Yellowstone, the Paramount hit. Michael, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. Really great to, great to see you guys this morning. Yeah, really great to have you on with us. I'll start off with a question. You were a working stage actor primarily. You did some, some uh, I think, TV and film work modestly before you were cast as Nick Hurley in Flashdance, which was, you know, a, a mega, mega hit. Um, you probably told flash dance stories up the wazoo for so many years, but I'd be interested to know if when you got that role, when you went out for that role, did you have any inkling that it would be such a huge <clears throat> thing in the cultural zeitgeist no. for all these, no idea. No, I had no idea at all. Uh, in fact, I was uh, living in New York at the time that, uh, that I heard about flash dance uh, i was in new york and and i got a call from my agent telling me that uh, sam peckinpah was directing a film and wanted to wanted to meet me so i flew to california met with him and he offered me the the starring role in his film which was called the osterman weekend mm. uh, and that was going to be at 20th Century Fox. And uh, that same afternoon, I was sent a copy of Flashdance. Um, this would be on a Thursday afternoon. And if I liked it, I would meet with the director on Friday, the next day at Paramount Studios. And that director would be Adrian Lyne. Uh, I had never heard of Adrian, uh, but I read Flashdance on that Thursday evening, and I really liked it, and I liked it better than the Osterman weekend. Well, what a wonderful position to be in, uh, uh, being offered a lead role in two major, in one major studio production. Uh, at Fox. On Friday afternoon, I went in to meet with Adrian and we hit it off. And he was trying to find Jennifer Beals to bring her in to see if we were a good match. And uh, she was nowhere to be found. And I was in the enviable position of uh, my, my agent was in the enviable position of, of saying, you got to make a move, otherwise we're going to go the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, so Paramount made the offer. Uh, I accepted flash dance. And pretty much the rest is history. The Osterman weekend, uh, I, I was, uh, I called Sam and I thanked him profusely for, for casting me or asking me to be in his movie because he was one of my, one of my movie heroes. And, uh, but I told him that I was gonna go with another project. And so I did. The Osterman Weekend did not perform very well at the box office. Who, who wound up in that role? Chris Sarandon. 
Ah, uh huh. And um, Flashdance went on to become Flashdance. Right. And uh, that was uh, that was how that happened. And and I believe Adrian Lyon up to that point had just done um, TV commercials. He had done TV commercials. He had done one feature movie called Little, Little Foxes. Ah, uh huh. I think. Um, but he was best known best known for TV commercials and uh, a wonderful, a wonderful director. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful uh, became we became great friends as a result of the doing the movie. I was curious if you had an inkling because that was it was a Bruckheimer Simpson production. Yes, they had not yet done films like uh, Top Gun. Beverly no. Hills Cop, Bad Boys, those all came later. But this, I think, was at the beginning of their, you know, blockbuster trajectory. But I, I yeah, that's why I was wondering if you had any idea how big it was going to. And 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 to even just to, to suggest how big it is still. I don't know if you've seen the um, the Gaines laundry detergent commercials. Yes. Yes. Know, yeah, where how how thoroughly it's embedded in the cultural zeitgeist. It must yes. really tickle you when you see that. Yes. No. It's 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 great fun seeing the impact that that, that the uh, the movie had um uh, uh women who are now grandmas come up to me on the street and tell me about the crush that they had on me <laughs> well i hadn't seen it in 40 years and i just watched it again the other day you know in preparation for our show and you right. make an entrance on the screen and you're like a greek god you know you well you're tall gray and handsome now but you're you you were really striking. You, you did great. You you know you you played your part well. And I I'm just curious to know too. Um, I'm sure a lot of actors they're known you know in their on their um, you know, on their tombstone will be engraved you know, <laughs> known for this film. It may not be the film they particularly want to be known for. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a film role you've had where that you can mentioned to us in our audience that you felt really captured your skills and your range, whether it was commercially success, successful or not, that really, you know, really that you're most proud of. Yes. Yes. Uh, and that would be a TV movie called Quiet Victory, the Charlie Wiedemeyer story, which was about a uh, all-American football player named Charlie Wiedemeyer, who was from Hawaii, who uh, came down with Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm. And uh, that was a profound experience for me portraying him. I got to know him and his family very well uh, during the filming. Uh, but it gave me an opportunity to uh, and a resp great responsibility because he was still alive at the time. Mm. Mm. And I wanted to do as honest and respectful uh, representation of Charlie's life as possible. Okay. So I would say that that's the one that comes to mind that I am probably most proud of. Yes, I, th okay. I think yeah, quiet victory. Well, we'll put it on an, on our watch list, and for our film Oscars fans to suggest, great, and Michael Nori fans watch Quiet Victory. You know, I I lived in Hawaii some decades ago, and I met Herman Wiedemeyer, who must have oh, been, really, yeah, who must have oh. been. I don't know what how he's related to uh, to Charlie, but um, I think it yeah. maybe a brother. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they went to Punahou High. Yeah. Yeah, and Charlie was a an amazing football player went on to Michigan and also became an all-star player. Dean. Yes. So, so, so to go from the sublime to the ridiculous, which is usually my department. Oh, goody. Mine get, too. Get, getting back to flash dance. Yeah. In the dinner scene. Yes. When she starts fondling you under the table with her foot. Yes. Was that a body double? That was her foot. And that was my crotch. Uh huh. Well, memories are made of this. <laughs> well acted, sir. Thank you. I was not going to let anybody sit in for me for that. Scene. <laughs> what a trooper! Okay, yeah. What a trooper! Yeah. <laughs>
but you played the lead in uh, on Broadway of the musical of Victor Victoria, the King Marchand yes. part, the part had been played by James Garner some years before. And I did not recall that it had been made as a movie first by Blake Edwards and Julie Andrews and, you know, Robert Preston and James Garner, but then later was turned into a Broadway musical and then subsequently a TV, um, a TV movie of the play. Is that correct? Right. Do I have that my facts right? Yes, I think that's, I think that's right. Yes, they recorded the, the Broadway show and that would have been the TV version of it. There was never, uh, uh, there was never planned to make a TV version of, of the show, but I think that there is a, there is a recording of the Broadway show that so, made it. So singing, singing has been part of your thing all along. Yes, indeed. Uh -huh. I've, I've uh, done, uh, I did the national tour of South Pacific, uh, which was a, a treat. Uh, we did that right around the time of 9-11. Mm. So it was a particularly poignant experience. Mm. Um, traveling around the country at the time that uh, that we were so vulnerable right uh, with this particular and specific uh, production of South Pacific which of course talked about the time in our history when we were at war on two fronts with Germany and Japan mm. Mm. and uh, it was uh, it was very moving uh, to travel around the country and feel the emotion of, of the, to feel the heartbeat of the country and the emotion of the country. Uh, that, and when we did um, a collection at the end of every performance for the people who were affected by the attacks. Mm. So it, it gave a great sense of purpose to, to what we were doing. Well, I think very apropos too, to the time because <laughs> You know, Rogers and Hammerstein took took a lot of grief for you know the whole "You've Got to Be Taught" yeah. song, and it's 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 import. You know, as far as you have to be taught to hate and to be prejudiced, and certainly that was a time in the around nine eleven when our prejudices were raging at the forefront. Yes, yes, that's right. I think I, there was a time a time in 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 its evolution that uh, they were debating whether to cut that song from the production is that right you probably you know better than i i th I, th I think there was debate but they stuck by their guns they were really yeah. um they were really quite you know i think quite active and committed in their yeah their social social activism yeah and thank god they were that's a yeah. it's a very important song i wanted just to mention real, just quickly as an aside I, I dean dean invited me to watch the the the, the video interview you did with uh bill alderson i think mm -hmm. that with bill alderson where where he prompted you to sing a little bit of um south some, pacific yeah of some enchanted evening. evening yeah and i i wanted just to, to share quickly my 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 dad was in theater in new york and he and my mom went to see uh they went to see south pacific and they had dinner with Ezio pinza no. after after the show and my mom in her most ladylike fashion when she would just tell could relay the story to us she said that was some man. He had three balls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh you know, funnily enough, I, Chris, I have a, 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 a South Pacific story involving your parents also. Oh, take it away. Which was that. Uh, <laughs> I uh, thought you uh, were going to say, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I thought you were going to say, I have a story too. I also have three balls. I also have three balls. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Michael, how did you know? Um, <laughs> no, uh, uh, Chris, Chris's dad, Bob, was a laugh a minute. Bobby Bush was just a laugh a minute. And, and I can still hear in my mind his voice saying, uh, knock, knock. Who's there? Sam and Janet. Sam and Janet evening. Yes, correct. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. It, uh, it came to my mind to bring that up, but I thought... I, I no, you leave it. Leave it to me to to stoop. <laughs> leave it to you to stoop. To stoop. You gotta have. You have to have three balls to tell that joke. <laughs> That's yes. right. That's right. You've got to be carefully taught. Um, now, Michael, you actually you go back to early in your career. You were in Search for Tomorrow. Yes. 
And didn't for one season you sang the theme song? Um, I wrote a song that I performed, but it was not the theme song for Search for Tomorrow. Ah. But I was on Search for Tomorrow for, I think, two, maybe two seasons or three seasons. Mm -hmm. And um, during that time, uh, we had we had a parade of stars coming through there. We had Kevin Klein mm. came in and I think uh, Al Pacino might have shown up one day. It was really, it was really fun. It was cool. It must have been fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the soaps were really a breeding ground. Yeah. Were they not for a lot of people who went on to become quite, you know, well-known, wonderful actors? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was a, it was a gig that you could, you could do during the day and have steady money and then you could do a play at night. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine you had to learn, you know, it was a good exercise for your quick actor's reflexes, lear learning scripts very quickly and changing circumstances and... Not so much in those, in those days, we had teleprompters. Ah. They have gotten rid of that uh, in, in, in recent years. Mm -hmm. But in those years, they had, <laughs> they, we had teleprompters. Uh -huh. Uh huh. Which was uh, not really good because you could, you could tell when somebody was reading the teleprompters. Uh huh. You've probably seen the, the photograph, the archive photograph of um, uh, De Niro. Uh, I'm sorry, Duval, Mar Robert Duval and Marlon Brando in the Godfather scene where Duval has got a, a, a white board on it taped to the front of his chest with Brando's no. lines written on the. No, I'll, yeah. have to find, I'll have to find that and send it to you. It's no, classic. I didn't. No, oh, no, but no, Brando was notorious. He needed to have his lines. They were all over the set. The, 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 the line when, when uh, um, uh, what's his name, Montana, Luca Brasi mm -hmm. co comes to speak to him in the, in the office and congratulate him on the, the wedding of his daughter. Uh, Brando's lines were on Luca Brasi's forehead. They were no. on like a post it or something. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He was the right eye line. <laughs> right. Oh my God. <laughs> Pretty funny. Oh. Um, from the filmography I viewed, it looks like you've had consistent and and uh, you know consistent work for many, many, many years. Um, is that the case that you always felt the next job was on its way or lined up, or did you deal with all the actorly insecurities? I am as vulnerable to uh, all of the insecurities as, as anybody is. Um, <clears throat> the challenge is what to do during the times when I am not, when I'm not acting, when I'm not employed. Uh, two years ago, I, was, I had an acting class. I was teaching young actors, uh, beginners, uh, you know, teaching them that acting cannot be taught. So it was... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you cash the checks first. I, well, exactly. I said, I'll take your money and then I'll, I'll tell you a secret. <laughs> um, so, and then that, that ran its course. And, uh, and now I am looking for something to do with my time uh, when I'm not, while I'm waiting for the next job. So I'm not just waiting for the next job that um, I have a meaningful life. I want to have a meaningful life. Uh, it's very important for, if I were to talk to uh, fellow actors, uh, we would, as expressive people, we need to be expressing somehow. Um, I'm very clear that uh, I am happiest and most content and fulfilled when I am in a position of service, when I'm serving in some way. Um, I try to see acting as a form of service, of uh, telling the human story. Uh, so I need to find a way to, to serve, to be in, a, in some, some form of, of serving when I'm not working. And as I get older, I just turned 76. And uh, I'm grateful that the phone still rings. Um, I wish it would ring more often. Thank goodness for meditation, which we can talk about, because without meditation, 
I'd, I'd be Looney Tunes. Um, so every, every day, literally every day, and uh, especially now, uh, um, I sit down and uh, with my dog, Charlie, and he joins me. Mm -hmm. He's a uh, Tibetan terrier, so he's a Buddhist. <laughs> and we meditate for at least one hour every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And this has been a practice of mine for the past 50, 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a way of maintaining my psychological equilibrium, my emotional equilibrium. But now you're yeah. also involved in, in uh, some philanthropic work, right? Yeah, just show with us a yeah. little bit about your philanthropic work. We'd love to hear. I started working for a, an organization called Seeds of Peace some 30 years ago. Uh, a friend of mine had started this organization uh, and he brought Israeli and Palestinian children together at a camp in Maine Mm. And uh, it was really put, putting a face to the enemy. Uh, these kids would sit down together in a circle. And I had the, I had the uh, privilege of, of being there with them. And they would have a conflict resolution professionals uh, in, their, in the circle. And talking about, it, it just humanized the experience. It humanized the, 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 the personalities, the people who were sitting across from them. Uh, how, how old were these kids? They were, age, the, 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 they raged in, in, in age, uh, I'd say from, um, early teens to their 20s. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge for Seeds of Peace for the organization was convincing the parents to allow their children mm. to come and participate in this because the parents were so uh, uh, galvanized in their, mm -hmm. in their prejudices. Mm -hmm. The children would return home as seeds of peace and make a positive difference. Uh, and the organization, organization is still thriving and, and flourishing. You know, I, I love that. Yeah. You've got to be taught to be afraid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no kidding. That's it. Yeah. yeah. What a beautiful, yeah. beautiful um, contribution to make. Um, yeah. I'm interested to know, you, you have um, Iraqi bloodline. Yes. Now, the Bush years were not exactly like, you know, Joe McCarthy, are you now or have you ever been? But did that ever come out or was that ever an issue that affected you professionally or personally? No, not at all. Okay. Uh, not to my knowledge. Yeah. Not to my knowledge. Uh, it might have made a difference to somebody somewhere, but uh, not to my knowledge. My father was born in Baghdad. Came to this country when he was 18. And uh, um, uh, no, that, that has not made any kind of difference. Most people assume that, uh, that Nuri is Italian. Italian or Greek. That it's an Italian name. Yeah. 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 Did, did you grow up with, with any uh, sense of that? cultural or ethnic heritage? Um, not really. My father, as is the case with most immigrants, uh, issued his, that, that identity and wanted to assimilate. And uh, right. Yeah, he, he had a, um, a British accent. Mm. He went to Georgetown, mm. so he was taught by Jesuits. Mm -hmm. English was his second language, and French was his third language. Um, and somewhere along the line, he he adopted an English accent, mm -hmm. which was mm -hmm. uh, 
pretty pretentious, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he was a, he was a charmer. Mm-hmm. Um, my mother was the Irish one. She was of Irish descent, mm-hmm. and she was very theatrical, and she was a an amateur actor. Um, she was very encouraging about my pursuing acting. My father was much more reticent about my my pursuing it, and he wanted me to uh, take over his life insurance business. Mm. And so I spent a summer in his life insurance office. Uh, a, a, a long, hot summer. It was. It was. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I wish I'd thought of that. Yes, it was a very long, hot summer. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, yes, so that lasted for two months, and that was it. And that's that's what really propelled me into acting, into committing myself to acting. Right. Now, also, I've heard a story that how you sort of got started as a performer and it had to in in the home that it had to do with the difficult dynamic between your parents. Absolutely. It was about keeping the peace. And uh, trying to restore peace in the family in a very tumultuous, combative relationship that my parents had. Uh, they were not, uh, they were very, really ill matched. Uh, I think the only, one of the few things that they had in common was Catholicism. Uh, my father was raised Catholic. My mother was Catholic. Um, <clears throat> aside from that, the cultural differences were just too, uh, too broad a gap to bridge. Yeah. So how did you, how did, what did you do? How, what was, what was your particular kind of d- familial tap dance there that you did to try to settle things, calm things down? Well, when I was too young to really articulate, uh, I'd say when I was in my maybe nine or 10, I remember going, going to each one of them when they were arguing, fighting and taking my mom's hand and walking her over to my father and literally putting their hands together. Mm. Oh. oh God, yeah, yeah. And not saying anything. I don't remember saying anything. It was mm. just uniting them, uh, which speaks to how unsafe I felt mm-hmm. in, that, in that house. Mm-hmm. Uh, all these years later, uh, I, I have to, I have to uh, acknowledge um, whatever neuroses I deal with and try to heal um, whatever insecurities I feel are really uh, attributed to that time in life where I just did not feel safe. I didn't feel safe in that house mm-hmm. because they could, they could, it could blow up at any at any moment. But did you feel their love? Was there ever any insecurity about their, you know, their love expressed for you, or is it just the mm-hmm. volatility between the two? Of you? Mm-hmm. It was questionable in my mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father was. Uh, uh, very uh, taciturn. Uh, he was a businessman. He was not emotional. Um, he tended to be, did tend to be, he was critical. He was very critical. Uh, my mother was emotional and she could be hysterical. So, and, 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 not balanced psychologically not balanced yeah so that did not feel safe i didn't feel that i could really trust it Uh, uh, so um, you put that together in a pot and stir it and voila you have an actor yeah no i was just going to say that that uh you know i mean that's 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 a tough way to grow up, but I swear that's what I see in your work. I mean, you've done such a a hmm. wide range of of roles 
like if if some some TV thing I saw you in where you're 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 some kind of Russian character th threatening people's lives and so forth, but that vulnerability, that human vulnerability, is I th I think that's the thread that runs through your work. It's very interesting to hear you say that. Uh, it's it's a very powerful thread in my life. And uh, it would be futile for me to try to conceal it. It's, um, I think it's a good quality. The, the vulnerability is a, uh, it's a, it's a good thing. It's uh, for, 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 for my art, it's a good thing. It's, um, it's not easy to live with that. Yeah. No, you're walking around with your heart open, whether you want to or not. Mm. Yeah. It makes things, um, it makes all your times interesting times. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm familiar with this thing a little bit <laughs> and, uh, and, and it, it, I mean, it, it, it means you're here as a human being this time around. You're, you're not here as a, as a rock or a cabbage or something. Right. And you're here to really, really get that, that human experience in all its its uh, thrills and spills. Yes, I think you know, mentioning. I'd love to hear a little bit more your 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 life in meditation, um, because having a skill like that, a tool to call on, you know, it's it is more self referral, and you don't you maybe depend less on validation from the outside world for 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 your value. You find can find it within yourself how how did uh, what were some of your meditation influences through the years and you know let's just hear your philosophy of of that whole aspect of your life mm -hmm. um i'm very reluctant to come across as proselytizing or trying to sell anything uh that that works for me uh so I will just begin with that disclaimer. Yes. And uh, when I was in my early 20s, uh, I was doing a Broadway play uh, called 40 Carats. Um, so I was on Broadway. I was making something like $750 a week, which was huge. Um, um, I had, I was in a relationship and my heart was broken and I was asking the question, why am I here? Um, I was experiencing a level of fame and recognition. I was working at what I loved and I was still flummoxed. I didn't know why I was here on the planet. And it was the broken heart that led me to asking this existential question. Um, and I started reading, uh, oh my gosh, I was reading uh, Autobiography of a Yogi. I was reading Ram Dass's Be Here Now. And I started to feel that I was being quite literally felt like I was being pulled in a direction um, towards something that was going to uh, satisfy this, answer this question, satisfy this thirst that I had uh, because I felt nothing made sense without knowing why I was here on the planet. Just nothing made sense. If, if I don't know why I'm here, I, I'm, I'm not here to suffer. I, I really believe I'm, I'm not here on the planet to suffer. So why am I suffering? And I had heard about somebody named Swami Satchidananda, and I went to hear him speak. And he introduced me to um, satsang, um, mm -hmm. spiritual discourse, and just listening to stories 
most of them um, Indian stories about uh, about Krishna and Ram and, and stories about Buddha. Um, and I was um, told about uh, a mantra, having a mantra, uh, a, 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 a word that I would repeat. So I, I tried that. My younger brother, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place here, but my younger brother had found a teacher named Maharaji. His name was Guru Maharaji. He was 13 years old at the yes, time. Right. And he was doing a program at Hunter College. This would have been in 1971. And he invited me and my mom to go see him. And we went, we sat there and he said, I don't promise to uh, fix your financial problems, your relationships or anything, but I promise that if you want peace of mind, I can show you how to have, how to experience peace of mind. And I thought, oh, you know, here we go. I'm Sign my prayer. Yeah, sign me up. My mother, uh, at that time, uh, my brother was going to India, flying to India, to be with Maharaji for a three-week program. My mother was working for uh, Channel 13 in New York, PBS, uh, as a contributing writer. and. She went with my brother, who my brother at the time was 16 or, yeah, 16 or 17. And she escorted him to India with the intention of exposing Maharaji as a charlatan, as a fraud. Mm. She got there uh, with a, uh, a, a large number of Western kids. Uh, she was probably the oldest one there. Uh, and she got there and she had an opportunity to talk to Maharaji and to tell him that she thought that he was a phony and that he was taking advantage of her son and all of these young people. Mm -hmm. He told her, look, I'm not asking you to accept me. I'm telling you that there is an experience inside of yourself, and I can show you how to experience that. And so she, for several days, went through um, a lot of conflict. Uh, and they were, at that time, they didn't have the, the amenities for the bathrooms. They had trenches. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at that time, she had, they, most of them had dysentery. And so it was very uncomfortable and unpleasant. And, and she was at the, uh, at the trench doing her thing and watching Maharaji shoot fireworks off the roof of his ashram. <laughs> and she was cursing him and shaking her fist. <laughs> You son of a bitch, you son of a bitch, we're down here <laughs> shitting in a trench and you're up there shooting off fireworks. And she lost her balance and she fell into the trench. Oh my God. And that was it. That was what kind of broke the fever. Uh, uh, she, it, it spoke to her. It was, it was, she, she saw that it was a reality. It was a metaphor that she was up to her ankles in her, in her shit. And so the fever broke uh, several days later um, with humility. She asked to receive this knowledge and she was shown how to meditate. Uh, two weeks later, she and my brother returned home having lost a considerable amount of weight 
And I looked at my mom and I said, what, what's going on? Right. Uh, and she said, I can't describe what it is, but he showed me how to experience something very beautiful. And so I took that as a cue to get on the next Metro liner from New York to Washington, DC, where he was. And I was determined that to, to ask for this knowledge. And uh, two days later, I was shown these techniques of, of meditation. And that was the beginning of my, that was the beginning of my practicing meditation. Uh, some years ago, he now goes by the name of Prem. Right. He's no longer Guru Maharaji. His name is Prem Rawat. Uh, Prem is Hindi word name for, for love. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in all reality, I sit down to do these techniques. I'm committed to doing the techniques, regardless of whether I'm experiencing something or not. Right. More often, it feels like, what am I doing? I'm just sitting here. I'm just sitting here. But there is something that happens. Mm -hmm. There's something that goes on between the time that I sit down to the time that I get up. It makes a difference. All I know is it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's, yeah. that's my story. That's a great story. <laughs> that's, that is, that is, that is fantastic. But, but speaking for a moment as a meditation teacher, which is, you know, what I do besides writing uh, is, you know, this is the thing I'm telling people again and again, don't worry about the experience during meditation. It is what it is. You know, the real, the real where the rubber meets the road is what is what happens the other 23 hours a day. And, and there's something that happens and it just kind of sneaks up on you. It comes in from somewhere behind your ears and just somehow life is better with it than without it. Yes. Yes. Beautifully said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's so interesting to, to be living in this time, you know, because, you know, the three of us started meditating when, you know, Chris and I both started teaching meditation at a time when we had to start every, every public lecture with a joke about, you know, beds of nails and crystal balls and flying carpets that, you know, this is not that. And even though it was a joke, we had to say that because, because the, the idea so much was, oh, this is some weird hippie cult, you know, Eastern something stuff. And now we're at a time when, you know, Oprah meditates and, you know, everyone's brother-in-law took a meditation course at the Y to lower his blood pressure or something. Right. And, right. and it's, it's, it's just been an amazing thing to, to be in this in this generation that's seen it go so deeply into the mainstream. Yes. Yes. Let me ask you a question. Um, do you ever feel discouraged when you sit down to practice? Do you, I know the mind is a wily trickster. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. The, because the mind, the mind is the mind and the mind, the mind can make up any kind of, you know, nonsense that it wants. Right. And the, the best advice that I've gotten from, from my teachers, and I've been with a number of teachers, is, you know, in one, you know, various ways that they've said this, but basically it's, it's just ignore it, forget about the thoughts, ignore them. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't grapple with them. Don't try to get rid of them. Don't try to resolve them. Just consider, so the way I say this sometimes to my students is I say, you know, when you're at the airport and you hear some people having a conversation in another language and you don't even know what the language is, just consider your thoughts to be like that. Mm. Mm. What, what, whatever they are. And there'll be thoughts about meditation, thoughts about the meaning of life, thoughts about, you know, what should be on your, your, your grocery list, 
it it you just there, there's an you treat them all with an equivalency it's all just waka 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 right right thank you for that yeah it's and it, it's all it's all the waves on the ocean of mind and the waves are supposed to be there they're not a mistake that's a feature not a bug uh and our mm. job is to just uh hang out take an easy attitude and allow gravity to pull us down into the silent water which doesn't have to be made silent it's always silent there below the waves and and the gravity of um of human life is always you know that that pull toward that peace that's what we're looking for in every moment no matter what we're doing and and meditation is just basically a a lab a you know a 15 minutes or an hour where we just let that gravity take over but we have to let it do it in its own sweet time right yeah, yeah. michael um do we have a little more time to we could talk about some of your favorite movies or yeah if that's we good. switch I've got, gears i've got coffee and <laughs> i want to start by saying michael thank you for including in your list of favorites a man for all seasons which I had never seen, and I watched it yesterday. Are you kidding, Dean? I, I, I am so, shocked. I shocked, shocked. So I had somehow missed that one. Oh my God! What it's a one film. of the great films. It is. It's on my top ten list. And Robert Bolt, who wrote it, and famously, of course, did Lawrence and Doctor Zhivago. I mean, what a brilliant screenplay. Yes, yes, and 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 what a collection of actors. Yeah. yeah. My yeah. God, my my only the only disappointment in that is that Orson Welles dies off so early. Mm. <laughs> you know, he's he, he they kill him off in his second scene. And he's I, I, I can't think of another actor who is just I mean, obviously, there are so many great actors, but another actor who's just always so. So such a treat to watch. Mm. so re reward you just like so delicious to to watch whatever orson wells does yeah. so let's just mention this is 1965's a man for all seasons starring paul schofield as sir mm -hmm. thomas moore and it's a just a beautiful and layered and textured look at one man's struggle to maintain moral integrity and ethical maintain integrity in in the face of uh in the face of, of challenges and ultimately including death. So riff on that one for a little bit for us, Michael, and what it is about that movie that. Well, it all comes down to the famous line, which I cannot quote, Paul Schofield's line to John Hurt at, when he's standing trial. Oh, I, I think, can I step in? Please do. John Hurt is rich, rich, Richard Rich perjures himself and basically puts the nail in the coffin for the Paul Schofield character. And as he's walking past, um, uh, Thomas looks at him and says, hey, so is, that the, is that the insignia of, on, or that you're wearing for, is that Wales? For, I said, yes. So, oh, you're now the Attorney General of Wales. Ah, I said, very good. He said, but Richard, Richard, it profiteth not a man to lose his soul for the world, but for Wales? Mm. <laughs> I, i'm close if not yes that's, <laughs> that's close yeah bravo that's very good well yeah. that's a standout film line i mean it's just yeah yeah and the other scene that i love is when he you know when he's he's being challenged for his family's challenging him for the position he's taken and that the, you know the, the speech he gives where he says yes i would give the devil himself the the, you know the benefit of the law for my own safety's sake do you remember it's just yes. beautiful got, beautiful scene yeah yeah it, and, it, and it, no go ahead michael please no i was just going to say it moved me i've seen it several times and it moves me on so many levels just as an actor to see the the the, the level of the performances of i mean robert shaw oh my god uh, as henry uh um there's, there's no, every every single character in there is a is a master class in acting um and then the the writing uh yeah I, 
it, it's it, I can't single out just any one thing. It's it's just a it's a masterpiece for me. And Robert Shaw is so brilliant. He's this, you know, big, huge presence and laughing and delighted. And here's the music I've written and all that. And then every once in a while comes the flash and you realize this guy's dangerous. Mm. This guy's this guy is just just barely containing his he's psycho. Right. Right. But absolute he's, power. And 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 beautiful Vanessa Redgrave shows up briefly as Anne Bullen and uh and like, oh, the new object of his affections, everything's fine. Now he can marry her. And uh and of course, unlike her, we know how that's going to turn right. out. Right. When I'm asked to to speak somewhere, uh, one of my favorite opening lines is, as Henry VIII said to each of his wives, "I won't keep you long." <laughs> that's that's a great that's great. It's a great opener. That's a great opener. Yeah. One one little trivia tidbit I, I I recall I'll just share that it's the only time that Robert Shaw and Orson Welles worked together on a film. Uh -huh. but four years after the film was made. Robert Shaw was renting Orson Welles' Madrid home for mm. holiday, accidentally started a fire, which burned and destroyed many of Welles' unfinished scripts and projects. Oh, my God. Can yeah. you imagine? Yeah. Oh, my God. I don't think he was invited back to that Airbnb. Oh, mm -hmm. dear. Mm -hmm. oh. Mm -hmm. well, they were brilliant. Just right. And Leo McKern as Cromwell and Wendy Hiller yes. as... as uh, Thomas's wife and yeah, Le 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 Leo McKern, who uh, who uh, most people probably know him uh, as the the high Tang. priest, the high priest in in Help, uh, yeah. but but possibly the greatest voice on any <laughs> any human being that 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 just rich kind of fruity in the best sense voice is just just yeah. a, a delight to listen to. Now another of your favorites. The Razor's Edge. Yes. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, the original. The original. Tyrone Power. Tyrone, Tyrone Power. Again, it's a man's search for himself, for his, his highest, uh, his better angels. Uh, um, I saw it many years ago for the first time and was very moved by, by that. I think it uh, when I saw it, it coincided at the time. Um, I don't know that I had uh, started meditating yet when I first saw that. I don't think I, I had. And I, it, it just resonated with me. I thought, uh, here is a guy who is willing to, uh, who, who must find out why he is here, why, what the purpose of his life is. Uh, that's what I like about it. That, yeah. that's why it touches me so much yeah T terrific novel by the way the a somerset mom novel, novel somerset is, mom. is, is yes. wonderful yes and i had read the novel before i saw the, the film yeah it, it, it's what was it 1940 something 47 i think maybe something i, mm -hmm. I mean to my recollection i mean I, I saw it of course many years later but at I can't recall a film, a Hollywood production, trying to depict Eastern, you know, the Eastern way of finding peace. Right. You know, with the Lama and the Lama Syria high in the mountains and the Western character who goes to kind of surrender all of his attachments, yeah. you know, to, to find, find the truth. Right. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to, um, to depict spiritual experience and to depict spiritually enlightened people in film without it becoming cheesy, you okay. know? And, and, and I always give credit when, when people try to, you know, when Bill Murray did a remake of The Razor's Edge and, and because he really want, he also, you know, felt a, a, a drive to do that. And he, the studio wanted him to do it was one of those meatballs or stripes or something and so he made it a package deal he had the leverage and he said okay i'll do that if you let me do the razor's edge wow and 
and and yeah, and exactly. and mo and usually it's people consider it to be pretty dreadful but but sincere just really trying to depict that thing that's so difficult to depict mm. interestingly enough you know somerset mom actually spent time in india and he the the the, the guru in the razor's edge is based on sri ramana maharshi uh, and Somerset Maugham spent time in, in uh, Ramana's ashram, it's at the foot of Arunachala, um, where I, I've been there, and I've been, you know, you climb, you go up the, the, the path up the mountain, and this is a mountain famously made of red clay, and you're supposed to take your shoes off, and you go up there barefoot, and you can sit in the cave, I've done this, you sit in the cave where Ramana, when he first at the age of 16, spontaneously became enlightened, then he ran away from home. And he wasn't interested in doing anything except sitting around being happy. So he just sat in this cave for, for seven years. But the, there's a famous, this famous photograph of Ramana Maharshi, mm -hmm. which many people, including uh, people who've had difficulty reading his books, which are, you know, of course, transcripts of his teachings. But a lot of people, they've just, they see that photograph and they, and some people's entire spiritual journeys have started from seeing that photograph. They, they see that and they go, oh, that's the stuff I want. Just mm. sweetness, sweetness in the eyes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really. That's lovely. Thank well, you for sharing that. That's a great story. I didn't hadn't known that about mom. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's a it's a chronic, you know, difficulty. Uh, actually, three friends of ours. My wife is a documentary um, uh, editor and and producer, and three friends of ours uh, did a film. Which Michael, if you haven't seen this, actually, I think you would enjoy this. It's a it's called Awake. It's the life of Paramahansa Yogananda. Oh no! I yeah. Know. Yeah, check it out. Awake, and okay. um, uh, and and they reenact his, you know, his initial encounters with his gurus, and 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 they 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 try to create a um, a filmic, you know, equivalent, a representation of some of his deep um, spiritual experiences, starting with experiences that he wrote about having certain realizations that he had while still in his mother's womb. And they managed to represent that on the screen, I think, about as well as any as it could be done. I agree. I thought that was a beautifully made documentary, and I thought it really distilled Yogananda and, and who he was and his presence. And, you know, didn't back off of the, even the challenges he faced when he came to America and mm -hmm. dealt with so much controversy and resistance. Just what a man. Yep. Mm. Another film you mentioned that you loved uh, that I remember seeing 50 years ago but had not seen since was the uh, 1970 uh, film Borsellino <laughs> with yes. uh, Belmondo, Jean-Paul Belmondo and Hélène Delon. Right. And watched it again. And of course, it's very dated. And I could see watching it that how it was really, um, it seemed like, you know, this came just a couple of years after Bonnie and Clyde and Butch Cassidy, the Sundance kid, and seemed to kind of combine elements from both. Right. You know, it was a bromance about good looking gangsters in France who rose through the ranks to take over the Marseille, Marseille uh, rackets. And, and uh, Belmondo and Elaine Delon were, um, you know, just the, the stars, French stars of their, of their time. And um, there's, you know, Elaine Delon, I was never very attracted to. I mean, you could see just his his just physical good looks were just right. stunning. You know, he was so good looking, but Belmondo had such charisma and physicality. He was the one I enjoyed most. Tell us a little bit about uh, why that made your list. Uh, well, I think I had seen that man from Rio. I, I was really a fan of Belmondo's and that it was, it was my, my, uh, uh, my appreciation of, of, of Belmondo that drew me to Borsellino. So I was a fan of Belmondo before I saw uh, Borsellino. I, I, I think Belmondo is just delicious. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he doesn't take himself, he's the exact opposite from Delon. Uh, Delon is, is, so, is such a narcissist 
and mm-hmm. so beautiful. And uh, somebody once said about Belmondo uh, that he's so ugly, he's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, I had the the honor of meeting, well, both of them in, when no I was kidding. in Paris. And I, I met Belmondo um, when I was in Paris four years ago. And I have a picture of myself with him. Uh, and he was just so lovely at Brasserie Lip uh, on the left bank. And uh, a friend of mine who knows, who knew him, uh, made the introduction. And he very graciously shook my hand and posed for a picture with me, which I have somewhere. Mm. Um, and I also had an opportunity to, to meet Alain Delon. And uh, uh, he was charming, lovely, a lovely man, very charming. Um, but um, I, I, I think it was Belmondo's physicality which really impressed me in, in that man from Rio. I, I, he did, apparently did all of his own stunts and he was just so alive. Some people have got this, this quality, this presence that you just can't take your eyes off them. Right. And, and, and I think getting back to your talking about teaching acting and you know, the secret being that it can't be taught. And I suspect that that's, that's part of what's going on there, part of what you're talking about there. There's this, you can learn craft and you know, script analysis and, and understanding, exploring characters, but this quality of presence, it kind of seems like you've got it or you haven't. Yeah. Well, I will just say you walked on the screen in Flashdance in one of the early scenes. And, you know, you know, I'm a happily married heterosexual man, but you, you know, you took my breath away because you just, it's just tall, dark and handsome. You're gorgeous, but you just so natural, you know, so natural and not full of yourself. Not, 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 you know, I'm interested to know what did, was that a curse or a blessing or both for you in your career? Um, being, being judged by your physical, you know, your physical looks or, did it hold you back? Did it open up opportunities or did it hold you back from opportunities? Well, I don't know if I'll ever know about opportunities that were missed because of my looks. <laughs> right. Uh, you, don't, you don't get to clone yourself and mm, do the A-B test. <laughs> yeah. Um, my goodness. Thank you for the compliment. I really do appreciate that. It makes me smile. Michael, it can't be the first time you've been told that there were some good looks involved. No, absolutely not. I, I, no, I've heard it. I've heard it a lot. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I much prefer um, compliments about um, about my acting. Um, uh, something, that, something, something you had a hand in. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. I'm grateful for my. I'm grateful for my 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 looks. They have uh, created opportunities for me, um, and I hope that my ability and my my craft have also created opportunities for me. Well, clearly they have because looks alone, you, can, you know, the the IMDb filmographies are littered with the skeletal remains of good-looking <laughs> actors who. Yeah. Didn't have sustained careers, right? And yeah, no, clearly. And with the Broadway having the Broadway chops and the musical theater chops, it's just a it's an integrated package, I would say. The great ones were the ones who just, you know, as you said, they never took themselves seriously. They didn't, um, you know, they 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 wore the the looks lightly. And you know, Paul Newman was like that. Gable was like that. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think pe- people, men or women who who think they are their physical beauty, that's a, that's 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 a doomed trajectory. Yeah, it's the kiss of death. Yeah, <laughs> uh, this is uh, Javier Bardem is one of my favorite actors now, mm-hmm. and he has that quality of. I agree. Self-effacing. He's- yeah. And he's got that that quality of presence we were talking about. You can't take your eyes off of. He certainly in that uh, 
that film on on uh, Lucy and Desi being the Ricardos. Yeah. He was he was the best thing in the film. He was Abs right. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. I think there's a quality that uh, that th th all of these people that we're talking about have is joy. Yes, there's joy. Yes, Bardem has joy. Belmondo has joy. Newman has joy. We're watching people who are filled with joy doing what they love to do. And that joy just comes right off the screen. It comes right through. I, yes. yes. Yeah. I've never heard it said that way. And it's abs. Yes. Cause this is what we're all hungry for. Yeah. And whether it's conscious or unconscious, I think we are unconsciously very nurtured by joyful performers, yes. joyful, joyful people. Yes. Yes. It's a great insight. Yes. And you know what? That's that. And, and in, every field every artistic field this is what the beatles you know yeah. the, the uniqueness of the beatles yeah they were creative musicians and so forth but they they brought that joy yeah exactly which connects us with our innocence yes and what a joy it has been to get to know you and to share you with our audience um michael nori really a joyful experience for us to have this oh, my conversation with you my new friends, I, I thank you so, so much for inviting me uh, to this wonderful meeting. And uh, you have really brightened my day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on the Philosopher's Movie Talk Show. Please subscribe to stay up to date on our newest episodes.